Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast, and you are listening to episode number 66. I'm your host, Rick Cole, and each week we take you on a trip down memory lane, back 50 years, where we report on all the hockey news from that period of time. And in this episode, we are looking at the week of January 25th to January 31st, 1971. This podcast is made possible by the support of our sponsors. Newspapers.com is the world's largest online newspaper archive. We couldn't do what we do here without them. They enable us to get back into the newspapers from that time period and uh, we can find all the news that was going on in the hockey world back then. We're also sponsored by the Breakwall Brewing Company located in beautiful downtown Port Coburn, Ontario, just steps from the well and canal on Lake Erie. The folks at the Breakwall uh, produce some of the finest craft beers in southern Ontario And I think they've got the best pub food on the planet. And when things open up again, I would love to meet any of our listeners at the break wall for a beer and a burger or some of their great homemade pizza. If you like what we're doing here every day on Twitter and each week on the podcast, uh, you you can help us out a lot by going to patreon.com slash hockey 50 years and subscribe to these podcasts. Uh, The subscriptions uh, get you access to uh, this podcast early each week, a couple days early, but it also gets you some great bonus content that we're producing for the subscribers. Uh, This allows us to uh, take a deeper dive dive into the items and issues that were going on in 1970 where we can report with a little more context and and a lot more details. Uh, One of our really fun segments in in our latest bonus episode that subscribers got looked at four games and five nights stretch for the Buffalo Sabres and it was done all through the perspective of general manager coach Punch Imlach, and he gave us some great insights in just how a brand new expansion team was coping with such a tough stretch. We also have special projects we're working on to cover in depth uh, the Ned Harkness mess in Detroit and also the uh, death of Terry Sawchuk, more from a perspective of how the media looked at the death of Terry Sawchuk. There was some things that went on there that... Uh, at the time we found rather strange and as years gone on i really disagreed with Uh, we think a five dollar month subscription is well worth your investment if you've got any interest in hockey history or even just in the 1970s as my dad always told me you can't know where you're going until you know where you've been Last week, we talked about Alan Eagleson informing the hockey world that he was stepping down as the leader of the National Hockey League Players Association, but we wondered if that was truly going to be the case. Uh, We talked about uh, Gordie Howe saying he was going to skip the All-Star game, then he was convinced to play, and he got the loudest ovation of anybody at the game from, of all places, the crowd at Boston Garden. And of course, we talked about that 24th annual All-Star Game, and we had all the details as the Western Division pulled off uh, a stunning 2-1 to upset in what, to date, was the most boring All-Star Contest the NHL had ever had. In this week's show, uh, well, i got a few games we'll, we'll tell you about, but we also have the stories, uh, the, these stories we've been following. Uh, the deadline Alan Eagleson set for the Maple Leafs to tr- trade a disgruntled and ill center Mike Walton came and passed. We'll tell you what happened with that. One other disgruntled player was on the move in uh, during the week in a deal that had a lot of future repercussions and we will examine that in a little more detail because this deal was something that really uh, had a lot of uh, elements to it. And a future National Hockey League general manager will make his professional hockey debut this week. And we're wondering if you can guess who it is. He's still in the NHL today, 50 years later. The first NHL game we're going to talk about this week was a Tuesday night matchup between the Chicago Blackhawks and the Canucks at Pacific Coliseum in Vancouver. The Canucks were smarting from a string of recent losses and uh, very poor performances that had resulted in general manager Bud Poyle 
publicly admonishing six particular players. Bob Dunn of the Vancouver province took a look at the situation and how it related to a surprising 3-3 draw between the best of the West and one of the bottom feeders in the Eastern Division. The motivating force uh, behind the, the Canucks' astonishing tie with the Blackhawks was probably something that uh, bore further investigation and Bob Dunn uh, kind of looked at it uh, under a microscope, so to speak. He came up with three theories. Theory one, that the words of general manager Bud Poyle, who verbally undressed six of the players last week, so infuriated the players in question that they responded by scoring all three Vancouver goals and all but one of the assists in the game. Bob Dunn's second theory was that a fan letter in Coach Hal Laco's mailbox Tuesday, which pinpointed the club's present problems became an inspiration when it was included in Laco's pregame program for the game against Chicago. The letter, by the way, was written from a 17-year-old Vancouver girl. And of course, the third theory was that the Blackhawks were playing their fourth game in six days in the middle of their toughest piece of scheduling this season, and they simply weren't ready for the Canucks mentally or physically. The most popular of these theories, of course, is the first because all eyes these days are on uh, fellows by the name of Ray Cullen, Mike Corrigan, Eddie Hatoum, Ted Taylor, Murray Hall, and Wayne Mackey. Mackey, remember, had that fast start to the season, but he had cooled off considerably by this time, and Bud Poyle was not happy with the decline in Mackey's play. Now, the only re rebuttal that these six players could, could possibly have from a fan standpoint was to perform on the ice. Uh, Cullen replied first by scoring Vancouver's opening goal, and Corrigan uh, replied the loudest because he scored the following two. Even when the game was over, when Cullen and Corrigan and Taylor and Hall had silenced most of their critics, they were reluctant to discuss their feelings of the last five days. And that's because they knew it was Poyle's prerogative to chastise his employees and it's not their prerogative to chastise him. You see, in 1970, that's the way the hockey world works. The bosses have all the power. They have the hammer. They can say whatever they want. And all the player can do is respond by playing better. Corrigan did say this. Uh, his remarks were, things have been going badly all year. The puck was just bouncing for me tonight. And that was all he would say. Ted Taylor, subject to some of... Uh, uh, Poyle's most scathing criticisms uh, he said I'm still not playing the way I should be the guy has four assists in 26 games I would say he's right about that he did go on to say I'm fighting the puck but that's part of my game right now and that line of Corrigan Taylor and Murray Hall was easily the Canucks best on the night it was a line Laco put together as a result of a team meeting Tuesday afternoon Murray Hall also had two assists in this game Hall thinks his familiarity with his line mates is probably a factor in the game he said I played with Teddy last year we have a better idea of what we're going to do out there Wayne and I have talked about it uh, we knew we weren't playing well but we just, just couldn't get out of that rut until of course the lines were juggled when things were going much better earlier in the season Mackey and Hall were actually opposite wingers originally on a line with the captain Orland Curtinback, who of course is out with that very severe knee injury uh, they've been with a variety of centers ever since Curtinback got hurt Poyle doesn't mention it, but anybody who knows a little bit hockey and has seen the Canucks play knows that Curtinback's absence coincided with the uh, downfall of the Canucks, their downward spile in the Eastern Division standings, which sees them on a steady trail towards the bottom of the division. This letter that I talked about from the 17-year-old, uh, which Laco was so proud, it was authored by a Vancouver student by the name of Ann Crossman. It's one of the most intelligent fan letters I've ever read, said Coach Laco. She was right, but she didn't tell me anything I didn't already know. If a 17-year-old girl can figure out what's wrong, then it's time somebody did something about it, and that somebody should have been and was Coach Laco. Laco declined to uh, actually describe what the letter contained. In a way, the Blackhawks were actually lucky to escape with a tie in this game. Again, they're fourth and six nights, and 
They did exhibit a little bit of uh, fatigue, especially uh, later on in the game. Goalie Jerry Desjardins uh, made the start for the Hawks. He made a brilliant save on Dale Talon late in the third period after Bobby Hull's power play goal had tied the score at 3-3, and he scooped away the rebound just before Rosaire Pema could knock it home. Then he stopped Paul Popeil cold from point-blank range, and that, in effect determined that this game would end up in a 3-3 stalemate. The next game we're going to look at was a Wednesday night contest at the Civic Arena in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, featuring the Toronto Maple Leafs and the hometown Penguins. This one was a notable contest because it marked the Penguins' debut of a young center they had just acquired in a trade with the New York Rangers. Silaps Jr., son of the Maple Leafs legend, had been a promising Rangers prospect until this week. Sill was having trouble cracking the Ranger lineup, and general manager Emil Francis thought that his present strength down the middle, with Jean Martel, Walter Kachuk, and Pete Stemkowski as his pivots, would provide him with depth at that position for years to come, and of course, Emil the Cat was correct. But Francis knew that the Rangers needed uh, a little bit more to compete with the Boston Bruins. He wasn't happy with their penalty killing. And he needed kind of an all-purpose handyman type of player who could kill the penalties, fill in on either wing on the third line. And Pittsburgh coach Red Kelly was having a few problems uh, getting along with a fellow by the name of utility man Glenn Sather. So Kelly made Sather available to the Rangers and the swap was arranged and Young Apps played his first game for Pittsburgh against the team for whom his dad had been the leader a generation earlier. Frank Orr of the Toronto Star uh, provided this report on Apps' debut. Uh, in historical value, the name still Apps meant little to the 9,093 spectators at Civic Arena. However, they're about to be launched into a crash course concerning that name's certain significance. Silaps Jr., son of the elegant Maple Leaf Center of the 1940s and present conservative member of the Ontario Legislature for Kingston and the Islands, made a smashing debut as a Pittsburgh Penguin. Acquired from the New York Rangers in a trade late Tuesday, App scored a superb goal, arranged a second marker, and earned the first star honors of the game as the Penguins dumped the Leafs 3-1. to one. The loss was the Toronto's third in a row and fourth in its five past five National Hockey League games and could be an indication that the Leafs are suddenly returning to earth after that very recent hot streak. You will uh, realize, of course, this season the Penguins have been trying desperately to find a, a, a center replacement for Michelle Briere, their brilliant 69-70 uh, rookie whose career ended in a crash uh, last spring. Briere remains unconscious in a Montreal hospital Tuesday. They sent strong checking Glenn Sather to the Rangers in exchange for Apps, who's just 23 years old. He opened the season with New York, but he had been sent down to the Central League to the, the Omaha Knights uh, after 21 games. He just couldn't seem to find enough ice time. Now, despite the fact of even one practice with the Penguins, Apps played an excellent game flanked by Pittsburgh's two other good young wingers, Greg Polis and John Pronovall. Silaps Jr.'s path to the NHL is actually not one that many players have followed. He spent one year at Princeton University in the United States, and then he moved back to Ontario and played senior hockey in Kingston while studying uh, and with two courses of a degree at Queen's University in Kingston. He entered professional hockey last season with Omaha, counted one goal in the first half of the season, but finished with 18 goals on the season, and his 10 playoff goals led the Omaha team to the Central Hockey League title, and things looked good for Sill Apps at that point. But young Sill knew that things got bleak for him, at least in New York, when the Rangers brought in Pete Stemkowski in that trade with Detroit. And he said right there, it didn't look good for him. And he was really happy to be traded to a team like Pittsburgh, where he knew the future uh, was up to him to determine that he would get plenty of opportunity to show what he could do. And in that game against Toronto, he certainly did. 
Penguins manager coach Red Kelly uh, was understandably very pleased with the trade. He said, we hated to give up Sather, who was a big fan favorite here and a fine team player, but we needed a center who could add some sting to our attack. Apps is young, he's got good speed, and he's a very, very smart player. Sounds a lot like the early days of his dad with the Leafs. Apps uh, was principally responsible for the goal that proved to be the game winner in the 3-1 decision for the Pens. Uh, he made a magnificent move, apparently. He he arrived slightly late at the Leaf blue line as a rush by his line mates uh, was taking shape. While the Toronto defenseman blocked off Polis and Pronovol, the two wingers, Apps uh, just kind of darted between the pair of them, took possession of the puck, and he fooled Toronto goalie Jacques Plante completely with an effortless deke. And I'm sure Jacques, who has a book on every player, hadn't seen too much of Young Sill and probably wasn't expecting the fine move that the kid put on him. Greg Polis had opened the scoring with a first period power play goal basically dunking Apps' perfect setup, and Apps scored the second. Billy McMillan got the Leafs goal at 18.47 of the third before Jean Pronovo clinched it by firing the puck into an empty net after Jacques Pont had been removed in favor of an extra attacker, in, and in this particular case, that one didn't work. Final score, Penguins 3, Toronto 1. Final game we're going to look at was a Friday night contest in Oakland, California, where the Golden Seals hosted the Buffalo Sabres. And this one was simply the Gilbert Perot show as the flashy rookie fired three goals to almost single-handedly beat the Seals. Now, report in this game comes from San Francisco Examiner's Jim McGee. Uh, we're going to try and give you a, the California perspective on another Seals loss, and we'll contrast that with a Canadian press report on the game as well. Jim McGee writes in Ice Hockey, a game of lightning movement requiring almost electronic reactions. You either do or you don't. The California Seals mostly don't. They have had some unaccountable lapses into complacency, enough to raise the giddy hopes that beneath Charlie Finley's gold and green outfits throbs a pulse of a possible championship caliber. Against the best teams in the league, the Seals have stood up like men and conquered. These are the easy games. Last night, they faced their acid test in the Oakland Arena. The Golden Seals were up against a team basically at their own level. The Buffalo Sabres, 32 points, entitled them to last place in the National Hockey League's East Division. The Seals are also in last place in the West Division with just one point more, 33. After the game, the Seals are now the lowest team in the National Hockey League with one point less than the Sabres, the newest of the expansion clubs. The loss was a shocker following home victories over the New York Rangers and Toronto Maple Leafs just three days before, and then a 6-2 victory over the Minnesota North Stars. Jobert Perot, the Sabres rookie, pulled off the hat trick, scoring three times and giving them 24 for the year, and that was all the Sabres needed to beat the Seals. Perot is bidding for the National Hockey League Rookie of the Year award, and he's shooting at a record 34 goals set by the Seals' Norm Ferguson in his first year a couple of seasons ago. Perot is, a, is a, no small guy. Uh, he's six foot tall, 190 pounds. Seals coach Freddie Glover conceded that Perot, quote, played well, but the man who beat the Seals and was the key to the game, he said, was Sabres goalie Roger Crozier. Crozier is just 5'8", 175, but he was a giant on this night. Glover explains why he thinks Crozier was the key. Particularly at the start of the game, Freddie said, and at the finish, he made saves he shouldn't have. And in the second period, he made two great saves when we ran two power plays at him. If you watched Roger Crozier in those Sabres opening seasons, and I saw a lot of games at the odd... He was often the only thing that made the games watching. Gilbert Perrault could lift you out of your seat with an end-to-end -end rush from time to time, although he didn't have much help. Roger Crozier had basically very little help, and some nights he was singularly responsible for keeping the Sabres at least respectable in games in which they had no business to even be competitive. Jim McGee spoke to Glover a little, a little more at length and actually got a quote from Freddie that pretty well sums up 
how the Seals' now general manager and coach feels about his team. Freddie said, if every man on the team gave 100%, we'd win. We handle anyone if everybody plays up to his capabilities. But in this day and age, that seems impossible. Here's what the Canadian press had to say about the same game. Uh, they start their report. Most of the products from Victoriaville, Quebec, reaching the NHL in recent years have made a big bang, but none have made the same impact as Gilbert Perrault. The town in the eastern townships, Victoriaville, midway between Montreal and Quebec City, has been exporting hockey sticks to the big leagues in countless numbers for quite a few years. But there's only been one Gilbert Perrault. Last year's first uh, overall amateur draft pick completed his first National Hockey League three-goal night in the game against the Seals, and that brought his season goal scoring total to 24. That's tops for first-year performers in the NHL this year. And by far, Jobert is the brightest light in the Sabres' otherwise bleak first season. Uh, but they don't talk about Roger Crozier in this game. But Jobert Perot was the best skater the Sabres could hope to have for the next few years. Perot, one of the most highly ballyhooed players to arrive on the NHL scene in several years, after leading the Montreal Junior Canadiens to two straight Memorial Cup titles, has done everything coach Punch Imlach expected of him last June. Imlach laid claim to the youngster over Vancouver's Bud Poyle in the spin of a roulette wheel for the first draft choice in the draft meetings last summer. Although at the time, it was a toss-up whether Pro or Dale Talon, the versatile scoring spark plug of the Toronto Marlboros, as who was the outstanding junior in the country. Pro made it known early that he preferred Pro. He made the selection, and now the kid is actually setting history and will set records as a first-year man in the NHL. And now the rest of the news from the National Hockey League this weekend. There was, a, as there has been this season, lots of trade talk. That was a main topic, actually, around hockey circles this week. It began on Monday with the speculation around the Rangers. Reports in several cities had Rangers General Manager Emil Francis busily working the phones in an effort to put his Rangers over the top in their battle for NHL supremacy with the Boston Bruins. One goofy report out of Minnesota had him working on a deal with the North Stars in which the Rangers would get Stars captain Ted Harris. But the Minnesota writers had Harris going to the Rangers in exchange for, get this, Rod Bear and defenseman Arnie Brown. Now, Emil Francis knows his team lacks that aggressive edge that seems to separate his club from the powerful Big Bad Bruins, but I can tell you this, that trade was not one that had any chance of taking place. Another Monday rumor making the rounds had the Red Wings in their never-ending quest to shore up their goalkeeping, working hard to pry Big Caesar Maniego away from the North Stars. Once again, the North Stars in a trade rumor. A Minnesota general manager, Red Blair, was said to be holding out for either of Gary Unger, Mickey Redmond, or the first-round draft pick of the Red Wings in order to give the Wings uh, Maniego. Now, New Detroit general manager Ned Harkness wasn't biting on that bait and claimed that he was not under any circumstances going to trade away any young potential stars like Gary Younger. Our, our next story is trade related in that it discusses uh, rumors of a present trade. Uh, it talks about a trade from a little more than 10 years ago in 1960. But I'm going to put this out there because uh, of the inimitable writing style of Toronto Globe and Mail columnist Dick Beddoes. You can say whatever you want about the man they called bedclothes. He could write, and I loved reading his prose, and I think I'll enjoy reading this particular column right now. It also covers another news item that uh, happened this week as well. Toronto hockey fans have been asking, what is the psychosomatic with Mike Walton and his lawyer, uh, has been answering the question, nothing that a trade away from the Maple Leafs 
won't cure. The trade hasn't happened, although the Maple Leafs have had only six or seven weeks to arrange a deal, and one hesitates to harpoon them for operating slower than a frozen caterpillar stuck in January molasses. One is be to beginning to wonder, however, if the Maple Leaf Mikados aren't putting themselves away as guys wearing a dog in a manger mien. The Leafs do not want Walton, and they do not want anyone else to have him either, unless uh, in return they get an arm off Phil Esposito and maybe two legs off Robert Orr, and then clear title to the Stanley Cup to boot. That's all they want. The first law of Stafford Smythe is, after all, you don't trade a Zircon for anything less than all 100 carats of the Colnour Diamond. Walton's lawyer, R.A. Eagleson, keeps saying Michael is more of a rhinestone so far as his value to Toronto is concerned. And why don't the Leafs settle for a couple of dime store trinkets in exchange? Mr. Eagleson was about to announce tactics to force such an exchange when yesterday he himself took ill with an impressive array of symptoms symptoms, subversive influenza germs, perhaps socialistic in nature, undermining his Tory constitution. Mr. Eagleson swore a complaint against the germs, took to his bed and revealed through a courier that he'd be back later in the week armed with matching cufflinks and necessary documentation. Mr. Smythe, therefore, has a few more days to guess whether Mr. Eagleson's threat is a bluff. In the meantime, a hockey player who could help 10 or 12 teams in the National League does not play because he is caught in a system which dictates all of his tomorrows. And even with all this, Walton is better off than Mark Rayom, who is listed in fair condition in Hamilton General Hospital after suffering head and chest injuries in a car crash Sunday afternoon. Mark is still unconscious. Rayom? Sure, Toronto hockey fans know about him. He's a solid journeyman on defense, up from St. Michael's College Juniors to join the Maple Leafs organization 17 seasons ago. Rayum was a hay pitcher on the Pittsburgh Farm Club for one season, and then the Leafs lugged him up for four and a half years when the franchise was in relative purgatory. Rayum played for George Imlach, when the big eye was assembling a future champion, but he wasn't going to be one of those players. He was the party of the second part when Imlac wheeled a major deal with the Detroit Red Wings. Comes to mind now, doesn't it? The late Jack Adams, running the Detroit Red Wings like he would a world war, grew disenchanted with Red Kelly, who threatened to retire rather than to report to the New York Rangers in a deal that Adams had arranged with the Broadway Blue Shirts. Trying to salvage something, hell, anything, Adams swung a barter with Imlac. Kelly, for young Mark Rayom, even up. Kelly was among those who made Imlac resemble a genius in four Stanley Cup triumphs, three in succession, 1962, 63, and 1964. Mark Rayon played 47 games for the Red Wings, then became a player who passed by in the agate type of the summaries from the minor leagues. He paused at Hershey and Tulsa, Rochester last winter in Vancouver, and selectors picked him as the most valuable player in the Western Hockey League last season. For some reason, the Canucks considered Rayom expendable when they expanded into the NHL this year. He was sent to the Rochester affiliate several weeks ago and given time to move his family back to their home in Windsor from the Canadian West Coast. Jim Ball, business manager of the Rochester Club, was saying Mark had been sick with the flu and hadn't played in our last five or six games. Then we got bombed 11-3 in Hershey Saturday and we wanted him for our Sunday game at home against Baltimore. On the phone, he said he'd come to Rochester right away. Rayom traveled by car from Windsor to Rochester on Highway 3, which runs from Windsor to Fort Erie through southern Ontario. He was six miles east of Dunville at about just about before 2 p.m. on Sunday, according to the Ontario Provincial, Provincial Police, when the accident occurred. His 1967 Camaro went off the road, slammed into a tree. Mark Rayom is in the Hamilton General Hospital. Uh, as of the beginning of the week, he was unconscious. 
There was fears that he might not make it, but Mark did recover. He regained consciousness later in the week and eventually recovered from the effects of that very serious car accident. On Tuesday of this week, the first significant trade took place and the repercussions of this uh, set of swaps would felt, be felt for years to come. Montreal Canadiens announced that they were sending disgruntled center Ralph Backstrom to the Los Angeles Kings. And in exchange, the Habs were to receive center Gordon Labossier, who incidentally was the first skater drafted by the Los Angeles Kings in the 1967 expansion draft. And they also got a young defenseman by the name of Raymond Fortan, who was presently toiling for the American Hockey League Springfield Kings. Montreal also received those nebulous, quote, future considerations, which most people assume would be a future amateur draft pick. Montreal's uh, brilliant general manager, Sammy Pollock, of course, had no intention of making any use of Labossier, a journeyman forward whose value lay mostly as a guy who could play large minutes for an expansion franchise. Pollock had already arranged for uh, Labossier to be passed on to his old friend and swapping partner, Ren Blair of the Minnesota North Stars. Blair, always happy to accommodate Uncle Sam, Pollock that is, in any way he can, gladly took the veteran Labossier off Pollock's hands, given up a 22-year-old center by the name of Reynald Como of the American Hockey League Cleveland Barons. And of course, Pollock also got more of those considerations from the future. Quite a few of the hockey writers around the NHL were talking about uh, this deal in terms that Mr. Pollock had to be going soft, sending a once highly valued asset all the way out to the warm climate of LA where Ralph had indicated he would like to play uh, when Sam obviously could have gotten more from other teams with better chances of contending for something anything playoffs anything at all but of course you have to look between the lines to see what Sam was actually up to here in fact whenever Sam's making a deal you have to look and read between the lines Backstrom of course will help the Kings he's better than just about anyone on that hockey team except for the veteran Bob Pulford and those two should mess together rather famously we would think but there's much more important consideration uh Sort of a two-edged sword, I'd say, with this deal. The Kings are in a battle with the California Golden Seals for last place in the National Hockey League's Western Division and quite possibly last place overall in the NHL. And that is the salient point here. The team, of course, that uh, loses or wins this battle, whichever you want to look at it, will then be uh, entitled to the first overall pick in the June Amateur Draft. And here is the rub. Canadians, at this point in time, own the Seals' first pick in the draft as a result of a previous set of transactions between the clubs engineered by Pollock and former California Golden Seals general manager Frank Selke Jr., former GM as we see now for good reason. So, if the Seals manage to finish last, Canadians will pick first in the draft. And of course, there are two great French-Canadian kids right at the top of the heat of, heap of graduating juniors this year, Guy Lafleur and Marcel Dion. Sam Pollock very badly wants Lafleur, and he will do anything to ensure the Seals finish last. That includes providing some much-needed help to the Seals' nearest rival for the bottom, that would be the Los Angeles Kings, and the help would be Ralph Backstrom. But there's also another angle at work here that was largely overlooked by most people who were commenting and assessing this particular deal. There was another very good reason for Pollock wanting to ensure the success of the Los Angeles Kings, at least for this season. The Kings also did not own their first pick, in the 1971 amateur draft. It had long since been sold to the Boston Bruins, Montreal's chief rival in the Eastern Division. Can you imagine if Boston had been able to add Guy Lafleur or Marcel Dion to the powerful lineup they already possessed? 
Well, Sam Pollock could imagine it, and he knew he had to take steps to prevent that from happening. So Ralph Baxter moves from being a pawn to a king, and the Canadian's future is shaped in a positive manner, all in one fell swoop by a genius general manager. Meanwhile, in St. Louis, their general manager, Scotty Bowman, had been telling everyone who'd listen that he was eager to make a trade to shake up what he considered to be an underachieving hockey club in the St. Louis Blues. Scotty, however, seemed to be unable to find a partner with whom to barter, at least on terms that were amenable to Mr. Bowman. Wally Cross of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch asked Scotty about the Blues trading prospects these days, and here is what uh, Wally wrote and what Scotty would have told him. The most popular indoor pastime around the National Hockey League these days is a fascinating little parlor game called Trade the Stars. This is a sort of a refinement of pin the tail on the donkey. The object is to convince an opponent to trade one or more of his better players to you in exchange for a couple of your worst. Not surprisingly, there have been few clear winners, but that doesn't seem to have discouraged anyone from attempting to match the great train robbery perpetrated by Boston General Manager Milt Schmidt almost four years ago when he acquired Phil Esposito, Ken Hodge, and Freddie Stanfield from the Chicago Blackhawks. So Wally Cross asked uh, Scotty Bowman just how, how come he wasn't able to arrange a deal like that. Scotty suggested nobody wants to get burned. I've talked to a few clubs lately and we're certainly nowhere near making any deals. Scotty went on to say, and this is very telling, it's the same story every time. Sure, we could probably pick up a good player or two, but everybody wants a Berenson, a Sabrin, or a Roberts in return. You'd be surprised just how many guys we have on the St. Louis Blues that nobody wants. Hardly a ringing endorsement from the general manager for the roster that he himself has built. Of course, you know what happened, don't you? The very next day, the Blues did make a trade. Isn't that always the way it goes Well, when you're talking to National Hockey League executives? Well, you got nothing cooking. And then the next day they make a nine-player trade. Well, this wasn't quite that way. It wasn't a major transaction by any means. But the Blues did bring in a player from the Canadians. There's that Pollock at it again in the form of slightly built but very talented Fran Huck, who made his hockey name as a star with the now defunct Canadian national team. In order to obtain Fran Huck, Scotty Bowman sent two Canadians uh, a future second round draft pick and what else those ever present future considerations just to get the chance to see if Fran Huck, 25 years old, still had any future as a national hockey league player. According to Vancouver hockey writer Hal Sigurdsson, the Blues made an offer to the Canucks for goalie George Gardner. The bait was apparently forward Frank St. Marseille and Vancouver general manager Bud Poyle was reported to have turned down that offer flatly. Now this one didn't really make a lot of sense to me, at least from a St. Louis perspective. The Blues have Ernie Wakeley and Glenn Hall in goal right now, and they uh, were doing an outstanding job. They could use an outstanding prospect goaltender because uh, both uh, Wakeley and Hall are far from being uh, young players in the league. Gardner's hardly that. He's over 30. So I think that if Scotty Bowman would understand that as well, and if he were truly looking to acquire a Vancouver puck stopper, and they've got three good ones in Charlie Hodge, Gardner, and Dunk Wilson. Wilson, in his early 20s, would be the far more attractive asset. In non-trade related news, a future National Hockey League general manager was about to make his professional debut as a player this week. Hans Tanner of the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle tells us about this young player. Tanner was writing about the American Hockey League Rochester Americans adding a few players this week. He said that in addition to Larry Horning, the defenseman obtained on loan from the St. Louis Blues, the Amerks will also have in their lineup a young center by the name of David Poyle. If the name sounds familiar, it should. David 
is the son of Vancouver general manager Bud Poyle, but he apparently is a pretty good hockey player as well. He earned all New England and all Eastern College Athletic Conference Division I honors while scoring 37 goals and adding 8 assists for Northeastern University in 1969-70. His college eligibility is used up now and the 6th 170 pounder is playing with the Braintree Massachusetts Hawks in the New England Senior League this season and in 26 games in that league he scored 33 goals and added 28 assists. Rochester general manager and coach Dick Gamble said he's got a very hard shot. We're bringing him in on a five-game amateur trial to see what he can do, and if he's any good, we'll keep him around for the playoffs as well. A few quick notes. There's talk that Jack Kent Cook, the owner of the Los Angeles Kings, is thinking about bailing out the financially strapped Denver Spurs of the Western Hockey League. The Spurs are in such bad monetary standing right now, they may be unable to complete the Western Hockey League season. Red Wings coach Doug Barkley says he's thinking about uh, reinstituting the Gordie Howe on defense experiment with the Red Wings. Actually, I think when Doug came out saying this, he was just placating his GM, general manager, Ned Harkness, who first came up with this harebrained scheme at the beginning of the season, more or less to establish his authority as the supreme boss over even guys like Gordie Howe. We'll just see how much of his own man Barkley is if Howe does wind up back on the blue line. That'll mean Barkley is probably succumbing to pressure exerted by Harkness. If Gordy doesn't go back on the blue line, you'll know that Barkley's being allowed to coach the team on his own terms. News out of Atlanta where the Atlanta Fulton County Recreation Authority gave final approval to construction of a $17 million all-purpose arena in downtown Atlanta. Builders said the construction might begin within two weeks and it would provide seating for 12000 for ice shows, 15000 for ice hockey, tennis, track, and circuit shows. Now, the NHL thinks Atlanta would be just a peachy location for a franchise, and this is good news to them. Vic Hatfield and the New York Rangers will represent hockey on the Don Rickles Show, which goes under the Kraft Music Hall banner on NBC next Wednesday night from 9 to 10. The title of the skit that Hadfield's involved in is called Locker Room Follies, but there are other athletes who will take part in as well. There'll be Joe Frazier, uh, Tony Conigliero, Boog Powell, and basketballer Bill Russell. And our final note of the week in London this week at Treasure Island Gardens where the London Knights play their OHA Junior A Series home games. There was a huge brawl uh, that occurred midway through the third period sparked by who else? Toronto Marlboro's Steve Durbano and London's uh, Jay Babcock who won't back down from anyone. The brawl lasted for about 10 minutes and it was finally stopped when arena officials began to play O Canada, Canada's national anthem, over the loudspeaker system. The players, probably more confused than anything else, stopped fighting. A total of 128 minutes and penalties were accessed to both teams during this love fest. So that's our show this week, everyone. And what did we learn this time around. Well, we learned the deadline for Alan Eagleson uh, setting up for a Mike Walton trade came and went with no deal taking place and no lawsuit being uh, uh, filed by Eagleson either. We learned that the Canadians traded Ralph Backstrom in a deal that clearly demonstrates just how Machiavellian Sam Pollock really could be. And we learned that a future National Hockey League general manager by the name of David Poyle made his professional hockey debut with the American Hockey League Rochester Americans. And little did we know at this time just how long young David Poyle would be around the hockey business. And he continues right up to this day. Here's some of the stories we're working on next week. Mike Walton finally will be traded by the Toronto Maple Leafs in a deal that by all rights 
should have cemented a very bright future for the Maple Leafs franchise. And that wasn't the only big deal of the week. We have details on another trade between the Rangers and the Red Wings. And a young superstar defenseman suffers a yet another bad break and his hockey future at this point was really in doubt. And we will learn that gambling is seen as a huge threat to the NHL by its new security chief. And of course, we'll have much, much more. The 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast is produced by Andy Cole. I can't thank Andy enough for everything he does for us with this podcast. Uh, the work he puts into this is, is far more than what I do, and, and we wouldn't be here without him. Andy now produces podcasts as well. For anyone who'd like to get something together, get a hold of me. I'll put you in touch with Andy, and maybe you guys can work something out. He's probably one of the best in the business at this stuff. The very popular Juno-nominated Toronto indie rock group, the Rural Alberta Advantage, provides our introduction and exit music, and if you ever get a chance to see them live, don't miss the chance to take in their show. They put on a great high energy performance. Other musical pieces in this podcast and sound effects are put together by Andy Cole as well. Our research comes from uh, all the fine publications at newspapers.com and also the Toronto Star and the Toronto Globe and Mail. You can find us on Twitter at at Hockey 50 Years every single day. We're on Facebook under the 50 Years Ago on Hockey banner and we have a WordPress site Hockey50YearsAgo.com. You can get this podcast anywhere where popular podcasts can be downloaded and don't forget our Patreon account at patreon.com slash hockey 50 years where you can subscribe to the great bonus content we put out every week. Thanks again for everyone who tunes into this show. We love bringing it to you every week. And on that note, we will see you next time. When the